Okay. So we will start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, Grant that by that same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Lady, Spouse of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, so these conferences are on the four temperaments. And uh, yeah, I think there, there are some of you who... Don't know what we're talking about. I heard that somebody said, four temperaments, what is what is that all about? So you're going to find out what that is all about. But basically, uh, this is a tool, right? This is useful information ordered to uh, helping you become a saint. Because one of the principles in the spiritual life is know thyself, right? Self-knowledge is very useful in the spiritual life uh, because it's in knowing ourselves, our strengths, our weaknesses. uh, We can better discern, you know, where God is calling us, what he's calling us to do. Um, We can be more patient with ourselves, with our weaknesses. We can be more compassionate towards others and their weaknesses, right? So all of this is uh, information that is meant to be of assistance in our journey in growing in love for God and love for neighbor. In fulfilling the will of our Heavenly Father as best as we know it, as best as we can do it. The information that I'll be uh, speaking on comes from the same book that we used at the last retreat, and that is The Theology of Christian Perfection by Antonio Royo Marin. Okay, it is my go-to as far as uh, spiritual theology is concerned. It's just a a gold mine, and um, that's what we're using. So this part of the theology of Christian perfection talks about the psychosomatic structure of our human nature. So we're talking about body and soul, okay? We are a composite being. It is a truism in psychology that no two personalities are alike. This being so, the perfection of charity will be manifested in different ways in different persons. So no two personalities are alike. Okay, that's no surprise, right? Because we're all (coughs) created uh, individually, uniquely by God, with respect to the soul, okay? God creates the soul unique and individual out of nothing, okay? And uh, we had no choice in the matter, all right? We just, uh, just like when God said, let there be light, the light came, right? There was light. And so uh, the same thing with us, when God called our soul from non-existence to existence uh, out of nothing, we obeyed, okay, and we were, our soul was infused into our body at the moment of conception. So everybody is unique and individual. So no two personalities are going to be exactly alike. There will be similarities, of course, uh, but there won't be any two that are exactly alike. This being the case, the perfection of charity will be manifested in different ways in different persons. And remember, this is what our holiness consists in. Okay? God is love, and we are called to become more and more like God. And so Christian perfection, Christian holiness, sanctity, consists in the uh, what is called here the perfection of charity. So let's just reword that. Uh, right? We are called to be perfect. Jesus said... Uh, You must therefore be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
And we have under, the church has always understood that to mean we are to strive, okay, to become perfect as our Heavenly Father because, of course, we can't be equal to God the Father, first of all, given the fact that we are mere creatures, uh, not to mention we have problems that come along with original sin and these type of things. So we are called to strive, and we are called to grow in that grace that we received at the moment of baptism. Okay, that is meant to grow and flourish and to arrive at an eminent degree, and that's what sanctity consists in. And that growth in grace corresponds directly to growth in charity, love for God, love for neighbor. Now, how this uh, eminent growth in love for God and love for neighbor manifests itself exteriorly is going to look different according to the differences uh, of the individual persons, okay? It's going to look different exter exteriorly, okay? A brief glance at the catalog of canonized saints will suffice to verify the fact that the perfect love of God and neighbor will be greatly modified by the som psychosomatic structure of the individual saint. But I would add to this, not only differences among the saints, but even the saints who shared the same spirituality. And if you look at the different Franciscan saints, they're not all like St. Francis. St. Maximilian Kolbe is very different from St. Francis of Assisi. Right? Their lives, you know, how their lives unfolded, the gifts they were given, the inspirations that they received, and the graces from God, different, and yet they share the same Franciscan spirituality. Uh, so, right, there is no surprise. When we look at the saints how grace operated differently in them. Thus, while all possessed heroic charity, okay, all of the saints, canonized saints, possessed the virtue of charity, the supernatural virtue of charity, to a heroic degree, there is a remarkable difference in the way in which this charity was carried into external practice in the lives of such saints as Augustine, Dominic, Francis Xavier, Peter Alcantara, Benedict Labre, Louis, King of France, and John of the Cross. Okay. They all look different. And so, when we're reading the lives of the saints, if we see certain aspects of their lives that perhaps don't appeal to us, or that we can't relate to, or that we have no inspiration to imitate, we shouldn't think that that's necessarily problematic. Okay? Because we need to be the saints that God is calling us to be that he has made us to be, not somebody else. So uh, we can certainly uh, learn from the examples of the saints and find inspiration and even imitation in certain aspects, but most likely not in every aspect. Okay? So that's where uh, discernment of what God is calling me to do uh, based on the gifts and graces that I have received. The supernatural does not destroy the natural. So when we're talking about psychosomatic structure, uh, we're talking about nature, natural gifts, and even natural weaknesses. And the supernatural, God's grace, does not destroy this in us, but works through it and builds on it. in such a way that the human body-soul composite can be a help or a hindrance to the workings of grace. And so this is where know thyself is so important because we want to know what aspects uh, of our body-soul composite are uh, configured in such a way that they tend to be a hindrance to the operations of grace so that we can strengthen that, okay? Uh, maybe remedy that, cure that, these type of things. Hence, it is of great importance to understand the manner in which man's psychosomatic structure concurs in the work of sanctification, although it does so on a purely natural plane. 
we shall discuss the human personality under the twofold classification of temperament and character. Now, I'm going to focus on the four temperaments. Uh, and again, this is the first time I've given these conferences um, laid out in this way, right? In three different conferences, and I'm not sure exactly how it's going to unfold and break down, but I definitely want to get through the four temperaments. If we can manage and we have time, then I'll start talking about character, too. Okay. Temperament is kind of what we've received. It's our inheritance. It's physiological. It's our DNA. Character is what we've made ourselves and, you know, the influence of the environment in which we've grown up in and the education we've received, this, these type of things. It's not uh, bound up in our physiology, but it's in, bound up in our uh, nurturing, our training, and above all, our free will decisions. Right? Our cooperation with grace, our lack of cooperation with grace. Are living according to right reason or not living according to right reason and good conscience and these type of things? That all has an effect on our character. So there is a diversity of opinion among psychologists concerning the definition and classification of temperament. For our purposes, we may define temperament as the pattern of inclinations which proceed from the physiological constitution of the individual. I'm going to break this down more clearly in a second. It is a dynamic factor which takes into account the manner in which the individual organic structure will react to stimuli of various kinds. So, uh, you may have heard of what's called first movements. So, in other words, um, you know, somebody comes up to you and... I don't know, they, they tell you that uh, your child uh, just got in a fight at school. You've got a first movement going on, okay? Based on that stimuli or stimulus, okay, this new information that you have, you now have a physical reaction, okay? It could be slow. It could be fast. It could be intense. It could be weak. It could be anger, frustration, impatience. It may not be, you know? But all of that occurred without your will actually being engaged. So we're talking about a first movement based on your physiology, okay, and how you react to various stimuli, okay? Since it is rooted in the physiological structure, temperament is something innate and hereditary. It is that element of personality which makes the personality unique since individuality is rooted in matter. And temperament is the natural inclination of the somatic structure. So, we would expect to find uh, two identical twins, okay, we're talking about two people who have the same DNA, to have the same temperament, okay? to have the same temperament. If, this, if that's not the case, then that will be a result of uh, the modifications, the slight modifications that have come around to their temperament based on their upbringing, free will choices, graces, these type of things. But uh, temperament can only be slightly modified. We would still expect um, Two identical twins, again, same DNA to have the same temperament, the same predominant temperament. It is therefore something permanent, since your DNA during the course of your life doesn't change, and admits of only secondary modification. Okay, slight modification. One's temperament can never be totally destroyed without destroying the individual. The axiom, grace does not destroy nature but perfects it, has its most obvious application in this area of temperament. The classification of the temperaments is nothing more than a handy framework. Okay, we're talking about four temperaments in these conferences. 
This is a framework which has been constructed according to the predominant characteristics of various physiological constitutions. So, predominant characteristics. It is by no means exclusive or definitive, nor does it signify that there are pure temperaments. So, we're talking about choleric, phlegmatic, uh, sanguine, and uh, melancholic. Okay. Nobody is really going to be purely that one temperament. There's going to be a mixture, but there is going to be one that noticeably predominates, that stands out above the rest. As a matter of fact, an individual person generally manifests a combination of characteristics of several temperaments. Whenever there are several elements combined in any composite, however, one or another will usually predominate at any given time. And in the matter of temperament, we find that, although persons are usually a composite of many characteristics, one or another characteristic will specify the temperament. Bearing it, this in mind, we shall discuss the four temperaments according to the ancient classification of sanguine, melancholic, choleric, and phlegmatic. Okay, now we get into the first temperament, sanguine. A person of sanguine temperament reacts quickly and strongly to almost any stimulation or impression. But the reaction is usually of short duration. So we've got quick, intense, but of short duration to any stimulus. The stimulation or impression is quickly forgotten, and the remembrance of past experiences does not easily arouse a new response. With every temperament, there are good qualities and there are bad qualities. Okay, this is why I've heard it said that um, whenever you study the temperaments, you always come out of it liking yourself less. Okay? <laughs> because nobody gets away with, with uh, having all good news. Okay? <laughs> Among the good qualities of the sanguine temperament, we may list the following. Affability and cheerfulness. Sympathy and generosity toward others. Sensitivity and compassion for the sufferings of others. Docility and submission to superiors. Sincerity and spontaneity. There, there may at times be a violent reaction to injuries received, but all is soon forgotten and no rancor remains. There is no obstinacy and stubbornness, but the ability to act with complete self-detachment. Others are attracted by the individual's goodness of heart and contagious enthusiasm. All right, so sanguine, uh, these are the uh, people persons, right? They love to be around people. They make friends really fast wherever they go, and they're fun to be with. Sanguine persons usually have a serene view of life and are optimists. They are not discouraged by difficulties or obstacles, but hope for a successful outcome in all their efforts. They are gifted with a great deal of common sense and a practical approach to life. They tend to idealize rather than criticize. Since they possess an affectionate nature, they make friends easily and sometimes love their friends with great ardor or even passion. Their intellects are alert and they learn quickly, although often without much depth. Their memory dwells on pleasant and optimistic things, and their imagination is active and creative. Consequently, they readily excel in art, oratory, and the related fields. They do not often attain the stature of the learned or the scholars, though. Sanguine persons could be superior types of individuals if they possessed as much depth as they do facility, and if they were as tenacious in their work as they are productive of new ideas and projects. 
The following saints are examples of the sanguine temperament. Saint Peter, the Apostle. Saint Augustine. Saint Teresa of Avila. Saint Francis Xavier. And Saint Rose of Lima. Now, it is important, right, as I mentioned, uh, this is meant to be an aid and an assistance to holiness. And we need to make use of the nature that God has given us in order to become the saints that he is calling us to be. Uh, because if we don't do that, um, things can be disastrous, right? We can use the gifts uh, for evil. And... I want to recommend a book, anybody who's interested in this topic and diving further into it, specifically with regards to St. Maximilian. Uh, there is a book that's been written. It's called Colby and the Commandant. Commandant spelled with a K. And what it does is it tracks the life of uh, St. Maximilian Colby and Rudolf, I think that's his first name, Hess, okay, who was in charge of the Auschwitz concentration camp. And let me just read to you the um, part of the introduction of this book because it compares these two, how similar they were. What a similar upbringing, but what a different result, right? We had one become a saint and a martyr at Auschwitz. We had another who, become, who became the leader and... Uh, murderer, right? chief murderer of Auschwitz. Hess was an ardent, committed militant who planned and worked for the complete extermination of the whole Jewish people and of all enemies of Hitler's dream. In the end, the lives of both St. Maximilian and Hess came together and each in a terrifying, redeeming way became a victim of the other. It is a haunting, incredible story. These two lives began only six years and a few hundred miles apart. Both children belonged to staunch Catholic families. Both were altar boys. Both wanted to be Catholic priests and missionaries. Both were highly intelligent and deeply sensitive. Both were taught to be responsible and obedient, courageous and resolute. Both developed resourcefulness and perseverance in confronting difficulties. They both were logistical geniuses, right? St. Maximilian running Neopakalanov with over 700 friars, 24-hour operations. Hess running Auschwitz, also 24-hour murderous operations. Later, the parallel paths of the two boys' lives began to diverge. Raymond Colby and his brother Francis decide to become to be Catholic priests and enroll in a Franciscan high school seminary. Rudolf, embarrassed and humiliated when a priest friend thoughtlessly informs his parents of a reprimand and punishment he had received in school, loses his enthusiasm for the priesthood and cools in the practice of his religion. Now, that bad experience that he had with that priest does not justify the path that he took. Although it was, in a certain sense, uh, an occasion, a cause. But, you know, those type of occurrences are not determinative. In fact, I know one of our friars, uh, I think it was when he was learning to be an altar boy, or maybe his first experience of being an altar boy. Okay, he was serving for a rather gruff priest. And uh, he handed him the water first instead of the wine. Okay? Now, apparently that was a big mistake for this priest because he said, the wine first, you stupid, dumb little punk. Okay, well, it, it didn't destroy uh, the vocation of this friar, right? I mean, he became a Franciscan friar. So, you know, bad uh, instances happen in the lives of people. Right? Uh, but I don't think those things are determinative, not at all. But here we see, uh, right, uh, Rudolf being uh, a young man, um, obviously the Christian approach would have been, you know, humility, 
forgiveness, these type of things. But apparently, he then started making one bad decision after another, you know, uh, losing graces and being more and more influenced by evil, right, culminating in the point of being in charge of Auschwitz. Now, thankfully, if you're not familiar with the story of Rudolf Hess, miraculously, he does convert before his death. Okay, he is tried for war crimes, found guilty, sentenced to the death penalty. I think it was around a week away from his execution. Catholic priest comes, he acknowledges all of the evil he has done, makes confession, receives Holy Communion, okay, before being executed. So I think we're talking about a miracle of mercy in his case. All right, we move on. Don't want to get off track. What time do we have here? 10.03, okay. All right, but each temperament will also be characterized by certain qualities which are dangerous and could become predispositions to evil. Thus, the principal defects of the sanguine temperament are superficiality. All right, they don't go deep. Inconstancy. They are wavering souls. So they're very much moved by their own sensibility. And see, this is the thing, is whatever our temperament may be, we can't allow it to make our decisions. You know, we need to live according to the higher faculties. Our intellect and our will, enlightened by grace, hopefully elevated by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that's how we want to make our decisions in life. That's how we want to be moved throughout our lives. We don't want our passions, okay, our sensibilities, our emotions, our temperament to determine the decisions we make. So this is the danger in the case of the sanguine person because they're very sensitive, okay, and if they're offended, watch out, they may just leave that apostolate and throw in the towel and not be willing to work anymore inconstancy, and sensuality, right? So sins of sensuality, they can be very tempted to those. The first defect is due primarily to the ease and rapidity with which these persons conceive ideas and the creative activity of their imagination. While they appear to grasp in an instant even the most difficult problem or subject, they sometimes see it only superficially and incompletely. As a result, they run the risk of hasty judgments. So we're talking about imprudence. Of acting with insufficient reason and of formulating inaccurate or false conclusions. They are more interested in breadth of knowledge rather than depth. The inconstancy of the sanguine person is a result of the short duration of his impressions and reactions. He may pass quickly from joy to sorrow. I'm of the opinion that St. Francis of Assisi was sanguine, uh, just from reading his life and... Uh, I mean, and, and this right here, in fact, reminds me of him. Right? He can go from uh, singing in French right? and uh, uh, pretending that he's playing the, the violin, right, with sticks, these type of things, to shedding tears right, for sins and because God is not loved. Love is not loved, these type of things. Uh, St. Francis strikes me as sanguine. I know there are other people who disagree with that, but... That's my opinion. Plus, he quickly made friends. I mean, he was very much, you know, gathered friends around him, was a leader of them, and these type of things. The sanguine quickly repents of his sins, but may return to them on the first occasion that presents itself. So very much led by his sensibility. Being readily moved by the impression of the moment, he easily succumbs to temptation. 
As a rule, he is not drawn to abnegation, sacrifice, or any effort that is of long duration. For that reason, he has great difficulty in observing custody of the external senses, in the imagination, and is easily distracted in prayer. His occasional periods of great fervor are often followed by discouragement and languor. Okay. Sadness. From the foregoing, it is evident that sensuality finds easy access to the sanguine temperament. Such persons are easy victims of gluttony and lust. They, must, they may react strongly and with great sorrow after they have fallen, but, the lack, but they lack the energy and perseverance to fight against the inclinations of the flesh when the passions are again aroused. The entire organism is quickly alerted when the occasion is offered for sensual pleasure and the strong tendency of the individual to sensuality causes the imagination to produce such phantasms very easily. So how do we control and guard against the weaknesses of the sanguine temperament? The development and control of any temperament requires the fostering of its good qualities and the eradication or suppression of its defects. The sanguine person should utilize his good qualities such as energy, affection, vivacity, and sensitivity. But he should take care that these qualities are directed to objects that are good and wholesome. For him, more than for any other person, the advice of St. Augustine has special significance. Choose wisely and then love with all your heart. At the same time, he must fight against the evil inclinations of his sanguine temperament. To overcome superficiality, he will acquire the habit of reflection and of thinking a matter through before he acts on it. This means that he has special need of deliberation or judgment as a subjective part of the virtue of prudence. Right? You see how useful this is? Right? If you identify as a sanguine, like, oh, that's why I keep making bad decisions that result in big problems. It's because I, I don't think it through enough. Now I need to intentionally take more time to think it through. Ask others for counsel and advice. You know, these type of things. Very useful to know that. Against his inconstancy, he will strengthen his will to carry through resolutions that have been made and be faithful in the practice of prayer and the performance of good works. Even in periods of aridity or in times of hardship or difficulty, so the sanguine needs to be also very attentive to that, right? That I need to persevere. I need to work through in difficulty, aridity, boredom. The secondary helps, which are of gr the greatest importance in this regard, is a plan of life followed conscientiously in the daily examination of conscience with self-imposed penances for failures. Right. So the sanguine temperament, being a free spirit, he's going to have the tendency to want to just wing it. Okay. Instead, it's probably a good idea so that you're using your time according to the will of God and not wasting time or spending a lot of time and effort in something that will be uh, bear little fruit. Okay, is to have a plan, okay, and pretty much stick to the plan. Think things through uh, with discernment, like what is God really calling me to do, not necessarily what I feel like doing. Sanguine persons sometimes need an expert spiritual director whom they should obey without question. So spiritual direction is... Quite useful, right? I mean, I would say, uh, well, the theology of spiritual um, perfection even says anybody really striving for holiness, sanctity, needs a spiritual director. 
if they have the possibility. For, I can understand sometimes it's not possible, but if there's the possibility, really it's a necessity. Lastly, sensuality must be combated by constant vigilance and an unrelenting struggle. Above all, the sanguine person must flee immediately from the occasions of sin and take special care to observe a strict custody of the eyes. The custody of the external senses and the imagination should be further safeguarded by the practice of recollection and practices of mortification. So recollection, meaning periods of silence, mortification, not always eating and drinking exactly what you want in the quantity that you want, uh, not being as comfortable as you want. It would be futile to try to avoid sensuality if the sanguine person were to leave the windows of the senses open to every kind of distraction and temptation. Okay, I think this is probably a good place to break. Um, so just an announcement here. I, I do have printed out a temperament indicator. Okay, so this is a test that you can take. All right, it is a um, series of, I won't say questions. I mean, some of them are questions, but basically you are checking the box where you see, you identify with these certain characteristics like charismatic, envious, jealous, happy, optimistic, prone to illness, easily discouraged, bullheaded, rash, etc. Like all of these different characteristics. And you just check the box where you say, yeah, that's me, that's me. And uh, then at the end, you um, go and look at the numbers, okay? And there's a chart where you circle the numbers that you have checked off. And that's going to be an indication of uh, what is the predominant temperament, okay? Temperament that you have. So now I printed out enough for each of you to take two copies because it's useful if you fill out one and somebody who knows you well fills out the other. Okay? Okay, so that, that should be, you know, between yours and that person who knows you well, that should give you a very idea of the reality uh, of your temperament. Okay? Um, so nobody gets away with anything here. All right. Uh, and uh, we have confessions now uh, from 10.15 until the next conference, which starts at 11. Um, so I think we only have two, maybe three confessors here. Okay, so it, probably not enough time for everyone to go to confession. And I know um, one of the, the feedback that we received from the last retreat was that uh, there wasn't enough time for confessions, but... The reality is, we, this is a one-day retreat, and if we're going to have more time for confessions, I would basically have to eliminate a conference, so balancing these two things, um, we just kept the confession time at what it is, the 45 minutes. Um, so that's it. We'll finish with a prayer, so you have time now. Uh, you can take your two copies of the test, and you can... Um, Start filling that out, re do some personal reflection, uh, and these, or go to confession. Okay, and we'll be, meet back here at 11. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Immaculate Heart of Mary. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.